Clark. Kristen Clark came to Rockford University in 2017 after working for 10 years on an inpatient mental health unit and seven years in private practice. She specializes in mood disorders and anxiety disorders. Kristen believes that college students are at a unique place in their lives that present new challenges. Kristen works with students to sort out past issues and current stressors to help them navigate through the college years and prepare themselves for their future endeavors. Uh, outside of work, Kristen enjoys spending time with her husband and three children. Kristen, interestingly, loves playing soccer, which I love too. Uh, even though it's more coaching her kids' teams rather than playing herself in these days, please join me welcoming Kristen Clark. Thank you, Orhan. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so thanks to Orhan. Thank you also to Marilyn Loyola and Nicole Riley for setting all of this up. Um, and Orhan already said this, but I was told that it does seem easier to just kind of go through the information and then um, do all of the questions, comments, and have the discussion just at the end. So, um, okay, so we'll get to it. So first of all, I wanted to just kind of cover um, just some mental health data from prior to COVID. Um, we knew it was a growing issue. Uh, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and suicidality. Um, and it's been growing over, increasing over the last 10 years. And um, so one third of college students prior to COVID were meeting criteria. So that what this means is they could be diagnosed uh, with, a, with a mental health issue. Um, and then just last year, uh, faculty were saying that they were definitely spending more time um, addressing student mental health needs uh, than they were just three years ago. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay, so why, is it, why the increase? Um, and this is just some ideas. There's um, lots of different theories out there. Um, it's easier to talk about mental health now than it used to be. Uh, there's definitely less of a stigma. Um, one of the reasons I think this is, is uh, 20 years ago, well, when I was 16 and I decided that I wanted to be a social worker, um, people said to me, they said, what? why would you wanna take kids away from their parents? And that was kind of the perception of what a social worker was. Um, and I tried to explain to them that, no, that's not what I wanna do. Uh, tried to educate them a little bit, but uh, that was definitely what people thought social workers did, less of the counseling aspect. Um, then, so about 20 years ago, when I was um, working in my master's program, uh, school social work was really booming. Uh, that's what people were going into. And so for the last 20 years, um, the availability of a social worker in schools uh, has increased. And so these students, our traditional age students now, are used to having a social worker available to them. And so that makes um, you know, the, uh, the availability of, to resources a lot better. Um, and then I think that's had a big impact on lessening the stigma uh, for mental health too. So, uh, and obviously there's a lot of higher expectations for academics. Um, just last week, my daughter said a friend of hers that goes to another school um, who's an eighth grader was supposed to be telling uh, the school was supposed to be writing a report about what she wanted to do come college um, so that they could start whatever her schedule was for her freshman year of high school. And I thought that's a little bit of pressure. Um, and then obviously to all of the social media pressures that, that we have going on for everybody. Okay, so then the spring and summer, uh, they put out a couple of different surveys were put out. Active Minds uh, does a lot of mental health research um, with uh, both high school and college students. Uh, but the first one here, the CDC report, 25%, so like a quarter of students were uh, experiencing some serious suicidal thoughts. Um, a lot of isolation going on at that point in time. Um, and so a lot of concerns. And what I didn't put, oh yeah, the 80%, I just added that a little bit ago. Um, so 80% of the students, this was in, uh, in the spring, uh, that COVID 
had a negative impact on their mental health. Now the slide before, um, it talked about the one third back in 2019 that met the criteria for a clinical diagnosis. This isn't quite the same. This, is, this doesn't actually say 80% would meet a clinical diagnosis, uh, but still I think this is pretty important information for us to know. Uh, good thing down there, that third bullet point down there, the students report that their campuses have generally been supportive, especially the professors. So good job, professors. Uh, this survey, uh, keep in mind, this, uh, so this survey was, it, it's a company that offers telehealth. And so, you know, since we have to keep in mind if someone's trying to sell a product, uh, and this, this is a company that sells a product. But um, this kind of linked into some uh, data that was just recently released last week. So I wanted you guys to take a look at this, uh, especially the 72% that feel uncertain about the future of their education. Um, and the 50% worried about future career and job prospects. Um, so many of the unknowns and, and what is all, you know, especially when the, uh, with the economy and so many people losing their jobs, um, what is that gonna look like? So, uh, then moving to the spring and summer, uh, what the concerns were, was what was I hearing from students? So obviously the isolation feelings um, a huge, difficult transition to remote learning. I mean, the, the, it was instantaneous and you guys know this and everybody had a difficult time um, suddenly having to do this and what is this even supposed to look like? Um, all of the different financial issues, people losing their jobs again. Uh, and then in the summer, after getting through the, uh, the remote learning, students just kept saying, I can't do it again. I can't do it again. Um, and then grief. So this, this is kind of interesting because we had so many losses in the spring. Um, but people all, you know, often identify grief with death um, and not so much just losses in general. And so um, a lot of students were experiencing grief, but they didn't realize it was grief. And um, so helping, helping students through the fact that you know, all these complicated feelings and like the roller coaster is, is the grief process. Uh, then all the unknowns, <laughs> are we going to go back to school? What's it going to look like? Are people going to do, we're talking about college students, are they really going to do what they're supposed to be doing? Um, and then many students who really, you know, they're going to follow all the guidelines and they're going to, they're doing everything that they needed to do by the book. But what if my roommate doesn't? And then my roommate's putting me at risk. Uh, so a lot, a lot of concerns. Okay, so by chance, last Wednesday, I got this report, the new Active Minds uh, survey results came out. So, um, a couple of things. This, so the first one, how has COVID-19 impacted your mental health? So remember back on the spring report, um, the negative impact was 80%. So if we look at, um, if we combine those top three there for the college students, it's still 76%. Okay, so that's still uh, <laughs> very significant. Um, and then the next one here, So this, uh, again, the big numbers here, and this is a select all that apply. I think that's important sometimes uh, to make sure we see what we're looking at. So this is select all that apply. So you could, you, you know, somebody could have clicked every, every one of these buttons, but uh, so most people were definitely the stress and anxiety, the disappointment, sadness, and the loneliness and isolation. Okay, so this is a choose one. Um, so the single most stressful, uh, no surprise, was a feeling the disconnected from friends and loved ones. Um, so no surprise there, I don't think. Um, so this is going back to the spring survey, um, the uncertainty at 8.93%. So the uncertainty related to my academics dropped to about 9%. 
And in the spring, that had been up to, uh, it was about 72%. So that's, uh, I think once everybody got back into school, realized what it was looking like, um, I think a lot of people did start feeling better about that aspect of things. Uh, this is something, so good job to student life. Um, number one, virtual interaction. Uh, if you guys remember back in the spring, they set up the Regent virtual experience at Facebook page. Uh, the cab and uh, cabbies and the Reggies were supposed to set up different kind of opportunities uh, to get the students to interact online. Um, uh, they had all sorts of different things that they were doing. So they did a great job. There was, uh, and I looked this morning, there's 522 members of that Facebook group. And so, I mean, this just proves just how important that was. And one of the outtakes of that, uh, of that group was that some of the students that were in that group, the, they had never been to any in-person activities, but they were participating in the, um, in the online activities and we just, you know, I remember talking about that in a meeting that that was just really interesting that um, they were connecting with students that they had never connected with before. So that was great. Uh, and then obviously number two, uh, the in-person interactions too there. So that's important. Okay, so again, this is good news. What we see here at the top, the hopeful, um, feelings have returned. So we got up to 78% um, are now hopeful again about school related goals and future jobs. So big climb from the spring report. Okay, so what were we hearing in August and September? Uh, all of these concerns, people aren't wearing their masks and they're not taking any of this seriously. I think we've all heard that. Um, and there's no, no easy answer to that problem. Everybody was saying, when are we going to be sent home? Um, and now not so much, I don't so much hear the students concerned that they themselves are gonna get sick, uh, but they're still very worried about their family members getting sick uh, back home. And I think the number one concern in August and even in uh, early September was every day was different. And this is so important, you guys, because we, you know, we just don't realize how scheduled we are. And, you know, students are now saying on Monday I have, on Tuesday I have. And we're used to, well, this is what I do on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And this is what I do on Tuesday and Thursday. And this is completely different. Every single day of their schedule is different. Uh, for our student athletes, um, especially the freshmen coming in, you know, athletes are used to, you go to school all day and then you go to practice and then you go to dinner and then you do your homework and then whatever else, right? And uh, now that, you know, they got a completely, every day is completely different with their, with their class schedules. Are they, are they gonna go to class that day? Are they online that day for, you know, even within classes, it's different every single day. Um, and like for the freshmen, they have to create this schedule then and create this balance. And they've never had to do this before. Um, so a lot of people, you know, so their, our students, their schedules have always been given to them. They just have to, you know, as long as they show up when they need to, they're okay. And we do, we function, humans function very well on a schedule. Um, our adult students, <laughs> our parent students who are trying to balance their kids, uh, school schedules, which can be wacky, and then uh, also their own schedules that aren't set. Um, so I think this is one of the hardest adjustments is that every day is different. Uh, okay, so let's enter October now. So October is always a difficult month um, across the board for mental health. So when I worked at the hospital, that was always our highest month for um, inpatient hospitalizations was in October. Um, I also worked for about two years at an agency that if there was a teenager that had run away from home or the parents had kicked them out, it's called a lockout, um, and the police had become involved, the police tried to get the, the teenager to go home. And if the police couldn't, then they would call this agency and I would go out and uh, try to do 
whatever intervention to get this to get the teenager to go home um, or to <laughs> for the parents to let the kid come home. Um, and so that was always October was always the highest month for those calls. Um, uh, we always have new students reaching out for counseling and professors are starting to refer. So that's kind of always in October. And this October, uh, the stressors we got going on right now, our positivity rate for our region is going up. Um, there's no fall break. So what I've heard in the last week and a half, maybe two weeks, is you know these students are just feeling exhausted. They want their, <laughs> they want that fall break, um, and 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 there's no, and it's not so much that it's a break but it's also a chance to catch up. And so these students don't have a time to catch up right now and you know, try to feel like they're back on track or try to get things back in order for their classes. And so it's just keep going, going, going uh, through all of this classwork. And I think that's, you know, it's one thing, yet it, it's the right thing to do without the fall break, it decreases travel and all of that makes perfect sense. But we just have to recognize um, kind of the fallout of that for the academics in that there's like, where's the catch up for these students then? So, um, and some, some students have talked about changes to the syllabus. Uh, and so obviously professors are realizing uh, where students are at right now. So, so that's good that professors are making adjustments. So good job with that. Um, but also when there's more changes that can also add more stress too. So, you know, trying to find the balance with that. And then the good news, students are starting to say, we might actually make it to Thanksgiving. So we're, we got some hope. There are some students with some hopes, so that's good. Okay, so now the good stuff, how do we help? So this resource here, um, if you guys, I don't know if you wanna take a quick picture of this screen uh, to get this website and you guys can have the uh, slides when it's uh, when this is all done. But this is an outstanding resource. It says there it's a practical, uh, it has practical approaches and it really is, uh, they really are practical approaches. So this is an outstanding resource. Um, and some of the next slides I have, um, the graphics are taken from this, uh, from this resource. Okay, so the first thing, how to help, first we have to recognize the warning signs. So here are the classic warning signs, things that you guys all know already. Um, and then we have the not so classic. These are the warning signs. These are our favorite students. These are the ones, you know, straight A students don't have problems. Uh, always are early to class. Um, always, you know, also look for students who have the, they're, they're always asking questions and it, it, it may be similar questions, the same questions. Uh, and you're thinking in your head, I already told you that. Um, but students who look for repeated reassurance, that's a sign of, of anxiety. So students who totally fill up their schedule, they have to be busy. Because if I'm busy, my mind doesn't go all over the place with my anxious thoughts, okay? Um, and color-coded planners, that's just when you know somebody's very, very good with their planner. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing, but just, just know that that's also, that person might be a little more anxious than other people. And we all have anxiety. Some of us have anxiety this big, and some of us have anxiety this big, okay? Everybody has it. Um, so just, those are just some, some warning signs there. Um, and maybe that statement at the bottom is a little strong. And, you know, maybe they're not all very anxious if they're doing those things up above, but just, you know, watch for those things. And some of those students, they are not okay right now because they do not have control of what's going on and they don't like that. So check on those students. So more warning signs of feeling trapped, the unbearable pain, we're gonna spend some time on that um, later on. Uh, one of the interesting things, so the, in, the increased use of drugs and alcohol. So we, we've all been hearing that um, ever since March, we've been hearing about that. Uh, some of us are sitting here guilty of it. Um, what was interesting was one of the studies had shown uh, that 
actually for college students in the spring, there, there was a decrease in drug and alcohol consumption. And I mean, everybody was home. So, uh, so, the, the, so actually for college students, the, there was a decrease back in the spring. Uh, so, you know, these other things are the normal warning signs that we're taught about. Uh, and then, of course, if you hear anybody talking about death or actually wanting to kill themselves, please, please, please make sure if it's a phone call or if it's online uh, on a Zoom call, see who is close to that person. Um, and, you know, there's with with suicidal thinking, it's a whole it's a whole spectrum um, where it's, you know, I, I just want to sleep all night to, you know, I have a gun. So, and there's any, any number of thoughts in between those. And so, um, but just make sure that if there is any talk of death or wanting to kill, uh, to kill themselves, that you make sure that, um, that they get to somebody or someone's able to get to them uh, to make sure that they're okay. And then if they do need any, um, if they need to go to the emergency room or how serious the situation is. Okay, so this, this starts talking about kind of how we normalize. So this goes back to what you should, you know, could have been done at the beginning of the semester. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Um, but let, letting the students know uh, from the get-go that you are someone they can come and talk to if, you, if, if they need anything. Um, but it's okay if you didn't do that. You can start doing this now. You can let your students know, you know, this is, we've reached a tough, part of the semester and we're not getting a fall break. And I know, you know, things are hard right now. So if you need anything and some, some students need to talk, please let me know. Okay, so you can, you can start this kind of process of normalizing the need uh, for students to seek help if they need to. You can start it now. Um, and actually, Mandolin sent a video to her students over the weekend, Friday or over the weekend at some point. And that was a great way to kind of normalize and just to kind of check in um, with how students are doing and, and opening up that door. If you need something, please, please let me know. So that was great. So when we, when we check in with somebody, try and have some open-ended questions um, you know, if you want to make it specifically about school, that's okay. Um, but there's, you know, how do you start a conversation? The safe things to talk about are, uh, it's for FOR, so it's family, friends, uh, occupation, or for us it would be school, and recreation. So three safe topics, <laughs> not politics, <laughs> uh, to just kind of start the conversation, uh, just to kind of get the student talking and then see, see if it goes to kind of set the stage for them to open up a little bit. So again, the normalization process and giving reassurance, it's okay to feel like this right now. Um, I know reaching out and setting up one-on-ones with the students, if it's on, you know, if it's, if it's a phone call, that's okay. If it's a Zoom appointment, that's okay. In-person is okay. Um, I know all of that is a weird way to try and connect. We all want it to be in person, but that's just not always possible right now. And then our active listening skills. Um, the, you guys can understand that. Mirroring the speaker. So that means, so if somebody's sitting in a chair and they're sitting back in their chair, sit back in your chair. Okay, so just kind of mirror what they're doing. Sometimes um, people will, will sit on the edge of their seat like this. And if they're sitting on the edge of their seat, then you should probably scoot up in your seat too. Maybe not quite as intensely as they are, but, um, but don't sit back and look relaxed if they're not sitting back and looking relaxed. So that's what that means by mirroring the speaker. Um, and this one the, at the bottom, <laughs> There's a Brene Brown, it says on the next slide too, I have the link to the video, but it talks about this, you know, uh, putting a silver lining on things. And we don't always want to do that. And the first sign of a silver lining is that, well, at least, and then, you know, you give them something, trying to spin a positive. And sometimes somebody just wants to be heard. They don't need you to spin a positive for them. Um, they just want to be heard. All right, so that's where we have to validate a person's feelings. So when they start talking, 
and just, you know, you're nodding your head along, you're, mm-hmm, right, I know, that makes a lot of sense, okay? Sometimes people question their feelings. They have a certain, uh, they say something and they're like, I don't even know why I feel like that, or I don't even, okay? Let them be okay with it. Tell them you've got every right to feel like that, okay? Um, labeling the things, their, their feelings. So, um, if someone sounds like they're all over the place and they don't know, like they're saying all these different things, one of the ways to paraphrase is to help them to label their feelings. Um, so it, you know, and it can be just really general, like you're feeling, it sounds like you're really overwhelmed right now. Um, or if you notice what they're talking about is grief, being able to, to identify that for them to help them see that is very, very helpful. Um, and as you're, listening and, and validating, make sure that you have an accepting and non-judgmental attitude about you. Um, and there's that website for Brene Brown. It's like a little three or four minute video and it's it's got an animation with it. It's her talking in the background and it's got this cute animation, but it's really good. Um, then thank the student for opening up to you. Um, so then ask them what they usually do. All right, so who do they usually talk to? Is it helpful? And then what does a person usually do to take care of themselves? And what we find when we ask that question is they're probably not doing it right now. So we need to make sure that um, if there's stuff that they usually do to kind of take care of themselves, whatever that looks like, that we really encourage that they get back to it, okay? Another thing here is so the, you know, when people do grounding techniques and um, they really need to focus in on the present moment, um, there's different ways to do grounding techniques, um, but it's really about focusing in on the present moment. And when we go and we think, um, you know, all of the different what ifs, which we can spend <laughs> forever thinking about what ifs with the situation, all that's doing is growing our anxiety and, um, and we really need to bring the student back to, okay, what's going on today? What are we doing today um, that we can do something about? And how am I feeling today? Um, so really bringing them back to that present moment. And then if it's appropriate, do refer them to counseling. You know, maybe when you're talking to them, maybe the counseling isn't, maybe it's tutoring, maybe it's, you know, it's any, any number of things it could be, but please refer them to counseling when it's appropriate. Okay, so this unbearable pain idea. This is something we don't like to talk about, all right? So this is a hopeless feelings and nothing is helping, all right? Um, this is sometimes uh, people describe this as the desert or the wilderness. Um, and there are times in our lives where we just truly struggle and that we are not okay. And this doesn't mean that we're going to go kill ourselves. That's not what this means. But this just means that we are at a very, very low point in our lives. Okay. And the older we are, the more of these times we have experienced. Okay. So the concern is that this may be the hardest time in a student's life so far. And what we try and do is we try and, you know, learn from our past experiences. What helped me get through that? Okay, or if I got through that, I can get through this, all right? So the more of those experiences we have, you know, the more realistic that becomes. But if we haven't had anything quite like this before that we're experiencing, it is unbearable pain. And we just, we, you know, if, if, if a student is describing that or if you're experiencing this yourself, um, you know, just, be there with the person and let them talk and let them listen. I promise you, you will not have the right words to say to this person, okay? This is a person who just needs to talk and they just need to be heard and they just need to be validated. There are no magic words for this situation, okay? It is support. Um, so there's different different kind of ways. There's a Buddhist, te uh, Buddhist teaching called the two arrows. You can look this up. Um, there's a whole story. Um, so the first pain, they use this, uh, the two arrows for um, patients with chronic pain issues. So the first arrow is the actual pain that you experience, the real raw pain. 
But then the second arrow that hits you is all of your thoughts that you associate with that first arrow. So you take a bad situation, but you grow it 10 times in your own head with all of the suffering thoughts. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting, um, an interesting way to look at this unbearable pain and trying to say, okay, separating the two, the first arrow from the second arrow. The second arrow, arrow we do have some control over, okay? Um, and then sometimes we have to recognize that we just have to surrender. This is the let go and let God. And I know that that just sounds so easy to do and it is not that easy, but we have to recognize that sometimes we just have to surrender and we just have to fully rely on God. And these are times, you know, where, where, where wherever you're at with your spiritual life, whatever that looks like to you, we have to tap into it. We have to tap into it because this is when we learn that we are only human and we cannot get through this stuff on our own. Um, and so, you know, if you feel comfortable having that sort of conversation with a student, and this is a hard conversation, but you know, where are you, do you have a prayer life? Okay, what do you do? Do you have any sort of meditation? What does this look like? Okay, and this may be very uncomfortable for some people to do, but it's very, very important to tap into this right now. So. Okay, so let's lighten it up a little bit. So these, this graphic, this is really um, stuff that we know. Uh, number seven there at the bottom uh, is huge. And this one's gonna get even more important with our media consumption, consumption as the election draw, draws closer um, because anxiety levels are gonna increase a lot. So, um, so this is, the, these are things that it's, the website is practicing what you can do while you're physically distancing from others. Um, and then, you know, moving forward, What's coming? What's going to continue to build our anxieties? Uh, so like I said, the election and after, it's not just, you know, after the election, people are going to have all sorts of things. So, and we don't even know when we're going to know who the winner is. So it's going to, this is just going to be a process with this that we have to know it's coming. And our students with all of that going on and they're going to start having their major assignments due. Okay, so that is a lot that's going to be going on at that point in time in, uh, in November. I have already had a student say, should I go home at Thanksgiving or should I self-quarantine before I go home to my family? Um, and I have a feeling that more students are going to have this concern that they don't feel comfortable going home quite yet. Um, that they think they need to quarantine before they head home to make sure that they don't bring anything to their family. Um, and then the holidays, you know, is what's Thanksgiving going to look like? What's Christmas going to look like um, with, with our family get togethers? And some students, you know, they have, they have really followed everything that they're, they've been very careful. And then their family is going to put some sort of, uh, you know, expectation on them that they have to go to this, to, uh, to an event, their family thing. Um, so all of this kind of stuff is we have to prepare for this, all of this upcoming stress too, that's going to build on the already, um, already the anxiety that students have. So, all right, Orhan, I know you're looking at the time. So that's it. That's a whole bunch of resources that I was looking at as I put this together. And so discussion. Nicole, do you want to put it like on the on video now or should I stop? Uh, we, we can take the questions. So whoever wants to ask a question, go ahead and then and unmute yourself, please. Anybody question? What are comments? I've got a question. Um, Kristen, do you have suggestions for us then about how to make it through November? <laughs> you know, I think with people trying to already, you know, taking a look at the syllabus and what it's going to look like. And I think just being upfront with the students, like I know this is going to get ugly. 
and I know. So already just kind of setting the stage for them so that they know that you're approachable. And um, I think that's the best thing. I think just knowing, know, having a student know that you're approachable so that if they are having issues that they can talk to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kristen, may I, may I ask a question? Uh, so in your, I think it was in your first slide or maybe second one. So you gave some numbers from a survey mm -hmm. this year. So anxiety levels are high, stress levels are high. So do you have any levels, any, I mean, I don't know, any results of previous surveys last year in 2018 or whatever? So can we somehow compare how much yeah. it increased? Or yeah, just, so you don't need to show it, you can just see it, but that's mm -hmm. fine. So the, in 2019, that's, um, they had put out um, some information and that was where it was the one third had actually met, one third of college students met criteria for a, for a diagnosis, um, uh, some sort of mental health diagnosis. So we moved from that one third to, but it, it's not quite the same questions. So we, we, so we knew that it was about one third a year ago. Um, and then, but the question was a little bit different. So it went to the 80%, but that was just that your mental health had been increased. Not that all 80% would, would, you know, could be diagnosed with something, um, but that the 80% definitely were having a negative impact. It was having a negative impact on their mental health. Okay, thank you. Anybody, questions? Kristen, Kristen, I have a question. Ooh, Donna, go ahead. Oh, I just had a quick question. If we have a student that we're really worried about, when do we refer them to you? Or is that what you want us to do? Yeah, so it's kind of, I mean, you kind of have to gauge what that conversation looks like. And if you're, if you're, you know, and everyone's got a different comfort level. And so if you think like, no, I had a good conversation and that student kind of has some direction, and seems like they're going to go in that direction, then that's probably okay. But you know, if there's if this if you're hearing some things and it's outside of your comfort level, then by all means refer them to us. Um, some people, uh, you know, right off the bat, like you know what you should you should go over to Lang and talk with somebody, even if it's just one time, just touch base, just get some different ideas. So sometimes that's a, that's one of the best ways to get somebody in the door. Is when you know when we think of counseling or therapy, it's like every week, and I don't want to do that. But if you can even just offer, you know, just go talk to them one time, just get some ideas. Sometimes that's an easy way to get them in the door. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, thank you, Kristen, for this presentation. It's really timely. It's all. It's on all our minds, and even our own mental health. I'm sure. So. Um, I've had at least three students uh, that are, have been COVID positive, mm -hmm. that are recovering or just diagnosed, or and they're trying and doing everything possible uh, to to keep up with work, to keep up with schoolwork, to stay in touch, to you know upload homework even if it's a few days late and all that stuff. Do you have any? Which just seems like Herculean to me. <laughs> um, do you have any? strategies or approaches that we should take towards besides being you know open with deadlines and kind of flexible on all ends if we can are there any what's the mental health aspect of being COVID positive and in the middle of a semester for a student mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question um first of all one of the things that we do do um Part of our process is once once a student is identified um, that they need to isolate or they need to quarantine, we do um, we have a follow up case management process with those students. And so every uh, we try, we can't do every day, um, but we try to touch base with the students at least every other day. Um, it might be two days in between. Uh, depending on how many we're following at that time, but we ask them, how are you doing with the teleparticipation? We ask them about their meal delivery. We make sure that they they're eating, okay? So we, so we do have their check-ins with them to make sure. And so far, across the board, all the students are saying, yeah, my professors have been great. So thank you. Um, so that's a very good thing. Um, but I think just being, 
you know, they're, they're recovering. There is definitely an exhaustion um, feeling afterwards. Like your body definitely does need to repair and people are tired. And so it is going to be a little harder to kind of catch up with the schoolwork. So I think just allowing them and letting them know, you know, as long as you get the work into me, that's okay. Um, I don't know if any, um, you know, on the faculty side, if there's been discussion about, you know, incompletes again, like the spring or, you know, are we not doing that? I'm not exactly sure where we stand with that. But if you guys are willing and you know the student situation and if, you know, whatever sort of extensions and just being, just being open to those ideas and letting the student know that it gives some relief, some comfort. Thank you. I think Catherine has a question. Catherine, go ahead, please. Yes, I just wondered, um, you talked about getting the PowerPoint um, mm -hmm. posted somewhere so we could get the website and all that. I just wondered where is that gonna be available and when? You know what? I don't know where it's going to be available, but if you email me, I will send it to you. Okay. Kristen, Kristen do you see a chat screen from your side? Like, uh, your side? no. Let me see what I can do. Yeah, something happened with the settings before this event that the chat box is not popping up. But just so everybody knows, uh, we post mm -hmm. this recording um, to the same spot where you registered, actually, on the ALC website. So we will have the video there, and then Kristen, we can upload any. Um, supplemental materials, so we can upload the PowerPoint separately as well there. Okay. okay, perfect. Thank you, Nicole. Jennifer has a question, I think. Yep. Hi, Kristen. Thanks for talking today. Um, I'm sure a lot of faculty might appreciate if you have any suggestions when you have a student that you, you have reached out over and over, you've been abundantly understanding, giving lots of extensions and you know, repeatedly, like almost bugging them to let them let you help them. <laughs> right. And you can't, you just can't get anywhere with some. Do you have any suggestions for that kind of scenario? So <laughs> at my last job, one of the, one of the things that I did in private practice that kind of like sealed the deal that I wanted to, to work in higher ed. Um, was I would have college students that were mandated to come to counseling, that they had gotten, you know, whatever had happened, they were on academic probation, um, and part of their probation was that they were mandated to, um, to attend counseling sessions. And so I had uh, several students that I saw for that reason. Um, and, you know, if something's going on with a student, and it's, you know, you, you have tried and tried and tried, you know, this... <laughs> I don't mean to sound harsh, but that's, you know, that's, that's the student and we do have to put onus on the students and, right. you know, I, I don't, I don't believe that we have to completely just keep, you know, setting everything wide open. I don't believe in that at all. Right. So, you know, they do have to take responsibility. And if it means, you know, to the point where you're like, you know what, I think something's going, something else is going on and I need you to go over to Lang to check in with the nurse or check in with, with one of the counselors. Um, and, you know, I guess you could do that, but I do not believe that, you know, you extension after extension, I don't, I don't see that as helpful necessarily. Okay. You know, if, if there's a time you got to put your foot down and say, no, this is, this is the final extension I can give you. That's what you have to do. Okay. Okay. Well, that helps. And I do routinely say, you know, point out Lang and the services that you offer. Don't know if anyone ever takes me up on it, but I do. <laughs> That's, we got plenty of students over here, so they are. Okay, thank you. Hey, Kristen, uh, maybe as a, as a wrap up, uh, so much of what students are, are struggling with is, is anxiety around you know, one issue or another. So I don't know if, if you had maybe a couple, three suggestions or something that you would put forth just related to helping students with anxiety. I mean, we're talking about COVID stuff today, but anxiety just in general seems like it's on the, uh, on everybody's radar in, in some new, in some new ways. Mm -hmm. So do you mean just kind of coping skills in general for anxiety? Correct. I mean, okay. things that, because one of the things is that, um, you know, sometimes somebody has to hear the suggestion, you know, multiple times before they can kind of take it to heart. So, just some things that we could all be conscious of uh, to encourage students around their anxiety issues. So again, if somebody is, um, 
you know, if you're talking to somebody and asking them the question, you know, what, what do you normally do? Do you, do you exercise every day? Do you make sure that you're eating right? You know, so, so ask the different questions of what they normally do, um, you know, when they're, when they're well, you know, we always, we're very, we're a very problem oriented society. We look for the problems um, and identify those, but we don't, you know, when things are good, let's identify why things are good and let's keep doing those things. Um, so, so that's something that you can do with students is asking, you know, when, when, when things are going good, what does that look like for you? And okay, so what of that is missing right now? Um, and then you're going to hear, I don't have time to go to the gym right now. I don't have time to. And then, you know, the follow-up to that is, well, it sounds like if you don't make time for that, the other stuff isn't going to fall into place either. Okay. And exercise, if, if someone has anxiety, and I've worked with people who have used anxiety, um, have used exercise as their medicine, um, and it's basically, you know, you, if you can get yourself into a routine of three to four days a week, you can really uh, manage anxiety better. Um, so that's the first thing, I guess, is really just asking them what normally they do and get back to it. Um, the, the very easiest coping skill in the world, I think, it's called two-syllable breathing. Um, nobody knows you're doing it. It is not deep breathing. It is just thinking of one word that has two syllables and you inhale with the first syllable and you exhale thinking the second syllable. And you just keep doing it over and over until you kind of take yourself through that moment um, when that anxiety strikes. This is, it, it sounds too good to be true. Um, what's funny about this one, I was actually, when I was in high school, I was at a church talk and the pastor was, uh, this is what he taught us and, 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 and it was with Jesus. So when you inhale thinking the first syllable and you exhale thinking the second syllable, um, so that's, that's the first time I learned it. And then later on, I was at a conference and somebody described this two syllable breathing and they talked me through it. And I was like, well, I've been doing that for years. Okay. So you, you know, you can use Jesus, you can use control, um, calm down, uh, little kids say mommy, um, teenagers often will use their pet's name if it's a two syllable word. So that is probably when you, you know, when you're feeling overwhelmed, that two syllable breathing is the absolute easiest coping skill there is. Captain, do you have a question or you forgot to lower your hand? Oh, I think she does not. Any more questions? Well, I think nobody has other questions. Okay. So. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. So let's adjourn the meeting. I hope to see you next week uh, with Professor Hardesty. Have, have a great day. All right. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen.